The path ends here in Kalapana, Hawaii, the newest land on Earth. As the lava pours into the ocean, mixing fire and water, new land is created by lava from Kilauea, the most active volcano in the world. Kilauea's current eruptive phase began in January of 1983 when Pu'u'o'o, a vent on the volcano's east rift zone, exploded in a curtain of fire. It is the longest eruption of a Hawaiian volcano in the last 200 years, generating an estimated 650,000 cubic yards of lava each day. Kilauea has left a trail of devastation and creation, forever changing the lives of those in her path. A landmark of incredible beauty and an ever-changing landscape, Kilauea is a special place to many Hawaiians. Uh, that's one of the most sacred of our, of our lands um, for the Hawaiians that have lived for many, many years and some of the Hawaiians that live today, that is the most sacred of our lands. For many reasons, one is because it is the home of Kripele and also because it is the home of creation and that because that land is still very much alive and the land is still growing. Okay? And so that growth has to be allowed. And so anytime you see you know, steam coming out of the land, that's an indication that the land is alive and it's growing and it has breath. Kilauea area is really the house of, of Pele. Pele is, she resides in Kilauea. But then also Pele is the lava that comes out of Kilauea, as well as the deity. So she is not only this deity that sits up here and is responsible for that lava, but she is the lava. And so she plays these two roles, whereas this, this big puka, or this, this caldera that is, that is made, then becomes the home of this, this fountaining of the lava. Kilauea's creative force can be seen in the works of artists who are attracted to the volcano's tremendous power. I'm a habitué of the volcanoes. Uh, I, I go there whenever I can. Uh, one has to get close to the subject in order to do a painting of it. One cannot just get back and say rather arrogantly, as some people do, well, I'm going to do it this way or do it that way. One has to get close to the subject, I believe, and let the subject dictate how it wants to be painted. This seems to have been the first European experience of Kilauea when uh, Captain George Vancouver, on his third visit to Hawaii, uh, came into Hilo Bay and Kamehameha happened to be there on his annual Makahiki tour around the island. Uh, Kamehameha sailed with Vancouver from Hilo to Kealapakua Bay, and as they past the Puna coast, Vancouver records how Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea were both covered with snow. And then he saw smoke coming from the flanks of Mauna Loa and was told about Kilauea, that this was a volcano. A Hawaiian historian and artist, Kane believes the inspiration for his paintings of Pele came from the volcano goddess herself. I wanted to do a depiction of Pele for some time, and I thought about it a lot. 
while shaving, while driving. Um, I knew she had to be a strong looking person. I tried drawing it. It got to the point where almost every day as I sat down in my studio, the first thing I'd do in the morning was spend about 20 minutes sketching the face that I wanted. And it didn't work. And a couple months went by and one day I just kept on sketching. And along about 11 o'clock, I had litter all over, uh, bad drawings all over. Uh, I just broke out in a sweat and came down hard with the pencil and, and the pencil seemed to be moving by itself and there was the face. And so I said, okay, baby, <laughs> that's it. Um, I immediately transferred that onto canvas and did a painting, which was my first painting of belly. Meaning mysterious or extraordinary, Kupayanaha, a vent almost two miles from Pu'uo'o, began erupting in July of 1986. It was the beginning of the volcano's most destructive phase. This stark and desolate landscape was once home to a thriving community. Kalapana was home to generations of Hawaiian homesteaders. And the newer subdivisions of Royal Gardens and Kalapana Gardens, now buried under up to 100 feet of lava, the town is almost completely gone. My memories of Kalapana are always gonna be the most beautiful place with the most beautiful people, which made it uh, all around uh, paradise. It was Hawaii, it's Hawaii what we'd call lost, but not lost because it's always gonna be in our memories and Pele cannot take that away from us. They were married on the famous Black Sand Beach. In 1980, Mary and Todd Dressler moved to Kalapana, looking for a safe and quiet community in which to raise a family. Today, the home they built themselves is only a memory. It was on Earth Day, April 22, 1990, that lava engulfed the Dressler's multi-level home. In a couple of hours, the home that took them 10 years to build was gone. It's been a real hard adjustment for all of us just to relocate and be in a rental house. We, for 10 years, were able to build our dream home that we always talked about building. And it was finally completed in 1986. And having that all taken away so quickly was a real drastic change for us. My husband and Danny Webb and Kenny Webb were the three primary builders. But everybody and anybody that stopped by our home, including our mom and dad, Dressler, helped us build that house. So there was a lot of loving hands that went into it. Starting from this lot that they cleared by hand, the Dresslers slowly built their dream home. From the oak floors and the hand-tiled kitchen to the stained glass window of Kalapana's painted church, building their home was a personal project for the family. They'll never be able to leave those memories. Lehua, our nine-year-old here, was uh, part of our home for nine years. She helped us build it. She was in all the transitions that we grew together. All my friends were there, and it was nice there, and we swam there, and it was just real nice because everybody was really nice to you. The biggest fact that we have in this whole thing is that really like our house burning down, you could always build a new house. Uh, it, it is shocking when your whole community disappears, completely gone, and everybody is scattered. Uh, I think that'll be the hardest part of this whole thing of, of everybody trying to pick up the pieces, find each other, and many people would like to build a community together again in, the, in a new location if the state grants it. Um, because the community isn't really the land, it's the people. Kalapana was beautiful. One of the few remaining Hawaiian villages, Kalapana is famous for its black sand beach and exquisite sunsets that fall into sapphire seas. But the essence of Kalapana is the people, the Hawaiian homesteaders. Today, much of their land is covered by lava. For those born and raised here, the lava took more than their land, 
It took a lifestyle that many say can never be replaced. A Hawaiian homestead, for those people who are not familiar with it, is an area where people were born, people were buried, and their way of life was because of the land. It is not like rural Oahu or different islands where your home basically represents some place where you camp and sleep and eat and then go to work. And the Hawaiian homestead for a lot of these people was an area for their total life, raising their food and playing, um, burying their family, and you know, giving birth to their family, etc. So it's a total lifestyle. You take that away, there is no more Hawaiian homestead to go to. They'll have to join the rest of the, the population in trying to find a place to live. Located about seven miles upslope from Kalapana, the relentless flow from Kupayanaha has created a vast wasteland. Currently, less than 20 homes are left. One of the few remaining homes belongs to Robert Kelei Ho'omalu and his family. Employed by the city and county, his job often requires him to man the roadblocks leading to active areas of the flow. The current roadblock is less than a half mile from his home. I've been out here on the roadblock all these times. It saddens my heart. And uh, I know our families, our friends that have lost their homes, their land. I know how they feel now because right now it's not too far from my house. I can put my feet in their shoes and feel how they feel. But with all them that have lost their homes, their property, I'm talking about our Hawaiian people. It hurts me to be here online and see all this destruction. It hurts me more, seeing people coming in, going out. Yeah, they come to get the eye full to see the destruction, but they don't know the story behind of all this destruction. I didn't know anything about it. I mean, I never really heard anything about it. I wasn't educated about it. I don't think that people on the mainland uh, really understand that this means loss of vegetation and animal life and homes and so forth. In eruptions such as these, and I'm specifying eruptions such as the one we're going through, it's different from the Kapoho eruption of 1960. It's different from the eruption of Mauna Loa of 1950s, where we lost land. This is Pahoe Hoi. Uh, unlike previous flows that I just mentioned were basically ah uh, ah. Uh. This is Pahoe Hoi that at average depth is anywhere from 50 to 100 feet deep. The people are never going to go back to these lands in their lifetime. And that cannot be emphasized anymore. All infrastructures of roads, every landmark is gone. Today, looking at Kalapana, the land has been cleansed. It's covered by lava. It's all covered, and looking back, it seems like you're looking back to the days of old, how the land was. You see houses, you see, you know, plants, flowers, you see farm. It's just something that, uh, you know, it touches me because uh, the area was so beautiful that you, you could see from one end to the other end. A master lauhala weaver, many Ka'avaloa has lived in Kalapana for over 50 years. Much of her artwork is made of lauhala leaves picked from around her home. As the eruption continues, her source of leaves is getting scarce. The lauhala is getting hard because all the areas that I used to pick is covered by the lava. So today where I went is the only section that is left. Who knows, it, it might be covered within next two or three days. It is. It's a hard job going out and pick the leaves. My grandchildren will always remember Kalapana, looking back to the Queen's Path and the Harry K. Brown Park, the playground, and also where they used to play in the pavilion next to the Catholic Church, and in the back of the church where they go swimming. Cakey pond, you know, that's something that they're going to remember of. It's going to take a long time before we uh, forget or take away or minimize some of the hurt we've seen and uh, the, the tears we've seen. 
I take that away and, you know, what I will remember as a person or what I think most people down here will always remember is uh, the people. I got a hunch that in time, some of these people are going to start to congregate in an area and that will be known as the new Kalapana and uh, the people living there. Uh, the feelings and the type of people that they are will not change. Located at the summit of Kilauea is Hale Maumau Crater. Each year, thousands of visitors from around the world peer down into the caldera. Kilauea's easy accessibility makes it one of the best understood volcanoes. What I used to think was it's just a big mountain with all this orange stuff coming out, but it sort of is a big mountain, with, um, and the molten lava and magma came up from underneath and comes out and through the holes in the top. And uh, there's a big reservoir under the volcano. It's not just all the uh, magma just comes out of the ground from nowhere. There's a big reservoir, and it comes out of a lot of different places, not just one. Kilauea's non-explosive nature allows scientists to study even the most active areas up close. 131. What we're doing out here is measuring the conductivity of the rocks, and that tells us where the tube is, uh, how wide it is, how deep it is, and also how much lava is in it. And it gives us an idea of which tubes are more active than others, and we can then pass that information on to CD to tell them where to expect, say, more activity or where not to expect activity uh, for hazard assessment. Well, this area was active yesterday, so I want to go up there. Okay, and we're over here right now. Yeah, that stop sign is... Besides doing hazard assessment for local authorities, one of the main functions for scientists from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory is research. The observatory was formed here in 1912 specifically because of, of the combination of having uh, eruptive activity at hand and the ease of, of access to study it and also the the relatively low hazard that is in, in terms of not having uh, uh, really explosive eruptions very often so that you can get close to study it. What most people don't realize when they visit Kilauea is they're actually standing on the volcano itself. Um, most people don't understand that uh, these are really mountains, but because they have such gentle slopes, they don't appear like mountains. To be volcanoes like Mount St. Helens, you know, looks like or anything like that. And what we're it's actually standing on Kilauea, and the lava is erupting out of a vent, and the vent is actually in the side of a volcano of the volcano in the East Rift Zone. We really have a unique opportunity in Hawaii because many, many geologists study volcanoes, but most of them are studying very ancient volcanoes. And here we have a volcano in action, so to speak. And so we can look at lava flows and actually see how they form. Um, a lot of geologists will say, look at an ancient lava flow and not really understand what is causing those ropey structures on the lava flow. Well, here we can actually see how they form, just like we can watch how tubes form and how a volcano will develop. When John Kiergaard sees Kilauea, he sees more than the orange fountains of fire and endless rivers of lava. He sees the little things that make up an eruption. Um, I'm trying to uh, make a, uh, a record of all of the various uh, small uh, events that make up a volcanic eruption. And I do that by going in and trying to shoot as close as possible. The biggest thing that you don't see, that you don't, that you're not aware of when you're watching a videotape is the heat. 
uh, the heat out there is tremendous. Uh, the more lava that's exposed, the greater the heat is. When you have uh, uh, high fountain eruptions, when you have a tremendous amount of red lava up in the air, it's just very, very hot. I've been out there in a rainstorm where one side of you would get soaking wet from the rain and the other side of you would be just as dry as toast because it's the, that's the side that faced the fountain. Working from his home studio, Kiergaard has produced several award-winning videos on Kilauea. He's been following the current eruption since it began in 1983 and has watched as news crews from around the world descended upon Kalapana. When you get crews that come in and they're only going to stay here for, uh, for a few days, and to them time is of the essence. Uh, they are used to operating in a situation where they have to elbow their way around to get what they want. They have to push and shove. And Hawaii really isn't push and shove. Um, as I've said before, you know, New York and uh, Kalapana met head on at Walter's store. And uh, that was caused by the people who, who were very important or thought they were very important. They were from New York. They were, they were, they were somebody. And when they got to Walter's store, they were treated by the, many of the residents as if they didn't even exist. A place where you could buy a soda or get some shave ice, Walter Yamaguchi's neighborhood market is now gone. Like other Kalapana landmarks, Kilauea's unrelenting flow has buried it under lava. What occurred down in Kalapana is still, I'm still assimilating it. Um, I, when I think of Kalapana, I don't think of it as the way it looks right now. I see Kalapana as being able to park at Harry K. Brown. I think I can still walk up and, and buy an ice cream from Walter's store. It, to me, that's how I see it. And I was there practically every day, and I watched the lava come through, and I watched Kalapana slowly being destroyed. And yet, it's too hard. I can't assimilate it yet. And so what I see Kalapana is a series of events, a series of things that, that were significant. One of the more significant events was when lava threatened one of Kalapana's oldest churches. Built in the 1930s, the Star of the Sea Church, or the Painted Church, holds fond memories for many residents. We used to walk all the way down to the Painted Church. In the back of the Painted Church, we used to have a gym. That's where we played volleyball, basketball, and baseball also to at the old Kalapana school. Oh, we had a grand time. On May 4th, 1990, the church was moved. Today, it sits across from the Civil Defense Command Center just off Highway 130, a symbol of hope that Kalapana will live on. <laughs> Other landmarks weren't so lucky. There are some things you just can't move. This August, the famous black sand beach was covered by lava. Current damages have been estimated at $61 million, and more than 170 homes have been destroyed. But for those who will never again play volleyball in Harry K. Brown Park, or walk the shores of Kaimu Beach, and feel the glorious waters of Kalapana, there is no compensation. They said they have a relief fund, sure. But we the people from the land, we're born and raised here. We're not no foreigners. These people that came to live in the subdivision, their land burned, their house burned. They can go home to America. But where our Hawaiians can go, nowhere else except Hawaii here. No one can deny her power. 
from artists who are drawn to the breathtaking beauty of her spectacular fountains, to the residents of Kalapana who have lost homes and land. Kilauea has touched them all. The path of Kilauea will be felt for generations to come. It will take a couple hundred years for the land to return to what it was like before the eruption, more than anyone's lifetime. But in the history of the world's most active volcano, it's just a blink of the eye.